Thank you, everybody, um, for making it to Tallinn. And um, as, as I said, um, one, one of the interesting things is uh, that we can also learn from uh, other countries and other territories. And this year we have a great American presence here. And also if America seemed to be a slight enemy uh, a few years ago in digital race, <laughs> And then um, I think it's uh, the challenges that we're seeing across the world are, um, are something that we need to tackle all together. So we're really happy to hear uh, about your experience as well. Um, but let's get going. So um, I'll start introducing from you, from Nietzsche. So very happy to hear about uh, your work at EMEA, which I think is, is very relevant, um, as well as your work as an integrate, content integrator. And then we get into discussion. Well, thanks. For, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I have multi two hats that I wear. I wear a hat for business, which is Stadium Media. I'm digital aggregator distributor, which I've been in this business for 30 years, and I can't believe I said that. So, But we also have another side. Back in 2006, while the digital world was starting to rear its head on the video side, I started getting contracts from all these different platforms and got so frustrated that I called a friend who is now the president of the uh, EMA and said, this is an unbelievably awful business. There's no way there's a future. This is pathetic. There's no standards. There's no best practices. We sat down in a light vision in his head. He said, well, oh, maybe there's a place for us. And from that came the digital EMA. And the digital EMA's first mission was, how do we speak the right language? So we created a glossary of terminology that we curated with all the studios, a lot of the indies in the States, and we actually published it. And it was like, just a guidance of how to actually determine legally what rights you're going to grant. And from there we talked about metadata. Oh, there's so many versions of metadata, what do you really need? So that's an ongoing four or five year process of getting metadata done. All the basic best practices in order to get the business going. You can't do a business unless you have the basics in place. And so that's what EMA is, they're a not for profit trade organization. And it's literally, how do we just help filmmakers, producers, just get in easier than it had been before. And digital is so, I guess, uh, nerve wracking to most that it's not. So how do we just make life easier? So the EMA literally, what we've done for many years, I'd love to see what we've done and have Europe, Asia, take what we've done, move it forward. Everything keeps changing, but we've already gone through a lot of the early pains. So how do we do what we've done, help you to move forward and uh, build a great business? Because as you know, it's the golden age. It really is. It's a great time. There's no negativity here. I didn't want to get this excited immediately, but no, it's a wonderful time in the business. There's no negative. It's a great time. I love your positivism. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> so, Missy, um, you worked um, at Sundance uh, with many um, great filmmakers. Then you went into something which is called BitTorrent. And uh, for many people, that might raise a red flag. And now you work as an um, independent consultant. So, I could a little bit talk about your journey um, and especially how did you get into BitTorrent and, uh, and why? Why would you go from Sundance to BitTorrent? So the program that I was co-running at Sundance is called Artist Services, and the mission of the program was to see how technology is changing the way that independent films are reaching audiences. And so part of my job was to uh, create partnerships with innovative uh, technologies and companies and trendsetters to empower and educate filmmakers to be leaner, meaner, smarter producers in that digital space. Um, BitTorrent was a company that we were uh, observing um, do very radical things in the music space. Some of you guys might have seen a Moby experiment with the BitTorrent bundle technology, um, and then later Tom York did something very innovative. The first film to really um, catch our attention was Tim League at Draft House used the actual of killing to distribute in um, certain territories to avoid censorship and from there uh, at Sundance we had an informal partnership with them and the more I learned what BitTorrent was trying to do that they're a 15 year old tech company that built a protocol that really revolutionized the internet as we now know it um, they they're they're not pirates they made technology that you know, is a pipeline and people are using it, you know, at any one time, one fourth of the internet is powered by that technology. Um, but how do they turn that, to, you know, f to empower creators? So why I went to go help launch their ad based streaming platform known as BitTorrent now is they have, you know, 200 million global users. They're incredibly artist friendly with, you know, their transactional splits and their ad based splits, as well as the data transparency of knowing who these fans are. So, um, that's, that was enough for me. 
we'll get to the challenges a little bit yeah. later. Susan, uh, you are the president of Europe International, which is the, the body organization of uh, 44 sales agents as well as head of sales at Trust Nordisk. So how are you seeing the situation in 2016? Well, um, I think, I mean, the, the whole, uh, I mean, the business is in development all the time. So, I mean, no one can say, I mean, 2016 was that better or worse than any other years, I would say. I mean, we are in, in a business which is a people's business, as you say, it's a promotional business. And we just open our eyes and need to work in different ways. It's like following projects and films from an earlier stage, talking together across the different windows that we are breaking or not breaking is one of the most important things nowadays, I would say. I mean, the Europa International was founded in order for sales agents to, to work together, to talk together, what are the opportunities, what are the threats, figuring out that we're actually not alone with the different problems with the different positive things and, and really shaking things up and thinking in a different way. And I think that's what what's important in our business is that each and every corner of our film industry is important nowadays, starting from the producers, going through sales agents, directors, the digital platforms, the people promoting. And, and I mean, I think it's what's become more and more obvious the last years is that the cooperation in between everyone is what makes this happen and work by the end of the day. Laura. Hello. Um, you have a really interesting background. You worked at Universal uh, with introducing new technology. Uh, you were involved in XPRIZE. Um, you were involved in, uh, in uh, promoting female entrepreneurship uh, through SheHackIt.org. And then you are one of the first residents now at TED, which is a phenomenal organization that started from a cons conference talk and now is a, a worldwide phenomenon of, of new media formats. I'm a big believer in um, the expanded landscape. So in the film business, I was equally involved in independent film. So on the board of the IFP, but I also worked at Warner Brothers. And then I worked at Universal. And when I morphed into um, branded content on the uh, cable network side, both branding and launching the networks and building the branded content libraries for them, particularly for, um, for Fox, um, you, I, I had to stand and learn about the technology side. And my interest these days is the expanded context that the film business finds itself in, um, of, being, of understanding that you're part of a much larger uh, content ecosystem that isn't just film and isn't just long form. It's, it's that it, an understanding. We no longer can ignore that. And um, as, as things have moved forward for me, I've gotten more and more involved with technology and with tech startups and impact startups, and it's really interesting, and we'll talk about it more, I'm sure, the parallels in the psychology, the business models, and the communities, uh, and the skill sets needed for filmmakers today are very similar um, to what is happening in the startup world. Uh, and so there's a lot of, of shared value and support system. Uh, not only do the, do the startups need to under, start to understand content and messaging and campaigns and many of the same pieces, but filmmakers, as we were saying, um, have always been entrepreneurs. They've just been in denial about it. Um, and, uh, That's so our first tweet, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag EFFT16 Media 25. Yeah. So I, I'm here to spread across those, those perspectives. Um, great. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. Are the windows breaking? And I, I think um, looking at the situation, we see that the classical model of, of theatrical and then and going next, 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 next is, is all kind of converging. And also what we see is the convergence is not happening so much on the distribution landscape. That's been talked a lot, but also the convergence happens at our industry landscape as well, that the difference, say, between an A-class festival or a MIPCOM or, or all of these markets is, is blurring. So is this really happening and why it's happening and, and what are the trends and, and threats and opportunities in there? Mitch, I know that you say that everything is fine. No, well, on the film festival side, my expertise is not there. That's a different animal when it comes to the distribution of digital. I'm a believer in windows. You know what? There's a, there is a value for each type of consumer out there. That's what windowing does. Uh, the industry is, in a way, kind of devalued some of the product, in my personal opinion, over time. You know, there is... The value of certain cars are not the same. That's how I always look at this. But 
Ad support, for one, AVOD. So AVOD is a wonderful proposition for people. Ad support, you've got to watch ads. There's money to be made, but that's not an initial value proposition when you release a film. Initial film needs to be valued higher, quality, sound, everything there. As we, as an industry, have we taken that and just kind of devalued it, giving a better value proposition for the consumer? We've had, we've had discussions of this. Nope, Missy's going to go with this, but I'm a, you know what? <laughs> there's something for everybody, and there's a time for everything as well. I wish there were a world where literally you could put something out at one time and everyone would make money, but a lot of times if you put it out simultaneously, you might devalue the proposition. And you, again, it goes to awareness, marketability, things like that, different consumers. So I'm a big fan of Windows. Uh, I believe in Windows too. I just, I don't think that um, ad-based streaming uh, devalues sound and quality and I don't know, I just didn't really get that point. But I think Windows are important and what's important is to not, there, we, we have a lot of channels and a lot of options and the old rules no longer apply. And so to approach a film in a very unique way is the approach that, you know, that's what I preach is, you know, just because it used to be in the festival for so long and then in the theaters for so long and then in a transactional window for so long, you know, those rules don't apply and to say, okay, I'm going to do option A for these films and then option B for these films, that's an old sure. school way to think about it and it's how do we customize it for this individual project? I must agree. It's, I mean, we have windows, but I mean, we don't need to break them. We can open them. There's, yeah. you know, another yes. opportunity that we're around. So, and, and it is, as you say, it's individual from film to film and it's just that what we can see in Europe compared to the US is that the process is much slower within Europe, both because we have regulations in different, uh, in different territories that needs to be broken down as well, and we have to learn. And again, for me, again, that's also about that everyone communicating together, meaning that we as sales agent and distributors are talking with the exhibitors as well to have everyone involved in how to break the windows, because for some films, it might be better to have them out only digital or have them out at the same time on the digital platforms than I and in the cinemas. And for other films, the traditional way is the better way to promote and have a film out. So I think it's a question of opportunities. It's a question of knowing that the windows are there, but sometimes you can open them all at the same time and sometimes you postpone it. I was going to say, I think we, back to the things are the best they've ever been. I don't think we've ever had a generation of filmmakers who know their audience as well as filmmakers today have the opportunity to. And if they are actively engaged in the conversation with where their audience is, then that can determine a lot of how they should be windowing, layering, rolling out, what is the right strategy for them. And that, that's just... Um, th that's just becoming a, a roadmap. It's a little haphazard, but the, the traditional film community has not caught up to that opportunity for the individual filmmakers. So the more we nurture that, the better we are. Yeah, yeah I think it's really exciting for independent filmmakers to have the approach of, all right, knowing that the system provides these alternative opportunities to release a film. Um, I'm going to create a plan B for that. Um, and, you know, I want to premiere at the top festival. I want to get the best sales agent and I want to get, you know, the flashiest deal possible. But if that's not the case, I have a plan B to fall back on, which, you know, is something that's well, very and exciting. It's a, and it's a yes and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So windows are a moving target. It is. It's, it's just like you said. It is. Each each property is different based upon it. And as I said with AVOD, there are certain properties that lend just to AVOD. That's where the audience is. You're not going to make it. So can you give there. a good example? Uh, I have some secondary. I've cl classic. I have a lot of library long tail scenario that you may put up transactional. So here's one thing that I do. So transactionally, I may put titles up there. I'm spending the money to deliver and code, get the artwork prepared properly, knowing that. I'm not really going to generate much business. I just know I'm not going to. But in a way, I'm seeding the marketplace because consumers will go, oh, you know, I like, but nah, that's not worth me paying for. And over, no, but literally, you're, you're subtly marketing to the consumer. And then once you get to SVOD, AVOD, that same consumer goes to multiple platforms. They go, oh, you know what? I'll watch it now. So you've almost like spent money marketing subtly by promoting them on transactional platforms. So 
there's subtle ways to get the numbers out. And then I've seen big reactions on AVOD and SVOD as, as well going, wow, didn't expect that coming. But in the back of my mind going, well, wait a minute, I've been seeding it for the past four or five months. Yeah, it's no uh, surprise that transactional is dying as we are as consumers living in a space where it's an all you can eat buffet and we're used to having these accounts where everything is at our fingertips and to have to pay $10 or $15 to purchase something at an EST price, that's that's a big commitment, um, which is why I think discovery, something that we all you know are worried about, how are our films gonna find an audience online? You're absolutely right that digital is long tail and there's an opportunity for us to use these different windows to create demand for your product. And it's curation, like you were saying. It really is curation. Who is the platform? Are they really partnering with you to curate the right to the right audience? It, it's not just to place it up there and pray. You really have to find the right platform that uh, appreciates what you're bringing to them. And that's the hard riddle because there are so many products that we all work with that just go right to the bottom. And it's like, that's the riddle. How do you make it viable? Susan, I'll, I'd like you to follow up on this because in one way it's very easy that, oh, independent filmmaker, become a marketer, money's coming, long tail, it's all so good. <laughs> I mean, at the same time, you know, you've also worked with, you know, many, many of Scandinavia's top filmmakers yeah. where we can consider them independent, but it's a significant investment. And of course, you have done a lot of uh, work with clever marketing. Think of Lars von Trier, for example. Yeah. But I think, I think it's, it's like, again, what, what we need to remember is that each and every film is different. And each and every film needs a certain way of being treated. And you can't say that because, of course, we can work in a certain way with, like, a last one tree, you're putting out small things where we, as a sales agent, actually go towards the end consumer so that the marketing campaign that we did was not only the business to business, which we, we would normally do, but... You can only do that if you have like someone like Lars von Trier where basically the business to business uh, advertisement is the same as you could do towards the end consumer because you can get the interest and you cannot do that for each and every film. And I think the most important thing is, and which should go all the way through the chains as well, is who is your audience. And it doesn't matter if it's like five people, but to to define the audience, and that comes from the very beginning when the films are being made, when the idea is being built, all the way from the director and the producer and all the way through the chain to really define who is our consumer, who is our audience, our target group, and then combining that with, uh, with like the digital pl platforms and stuff like that. The most important thing is the curation is how can I find how can I make sure that this movie is not disappearing on that platform because I mean one, one of the biggest issues and I think especially within Europe is that many of the platforms they are not made in an easy approachable way yet meaning that it's really really hard to find what you want to see if you don't know it and if it's not the known directors it's always easy to to kind of write El Motovar and you will find find his movies, but to find the niche products, to have like, you know, the, the whole development of the digital platforms needs to be improved in order for us to find and curate it in a way that, I mean, we can find stuff, basically. I, there's no foreign category on Netflix. That's really a problem. Right, like how, what can we do to, to put pressure or create demand uh, or to give the data back to a Netflix that there's enough interest in, in America or in North America that we'd like to see the best of foreign films? There's, that, I, that, I'm gobsmacked. Mitch, right? that's that actually a, a question for you. You've been doing the practice. Where is the category? Oh, well, Netflix is a different animal unto itself. <laughs> No, but but it's but, but it's the big it's the elephant in the room, right? No. That's that's sucking up so much of the oxygen. So wouldn't it be great if I could look for foreign films and I can't? That makes me crazy. And every no, but every platform has a different way to get to the audience, which comes down no, which one comes down to what we're all talking about it comes down to basics. I mean, it, it starts with the basics. Is your artwork attractive for somebody to actually stop and go, wow, what is that? Is the metadata correct? There's all the information there for the tag so that someone can maybe stumble upon it. And that's where the whole EMAs thing came. It's like, there are no, we, you need to think about that to begin when you're starting a project, like we spoke earlier. Before you get going, think about who your audience is and how you're going to find them. 
And to Susan's point, you know, even if it is five people, uh, or if, if, you're, if you have the luxury to work with these film projects early on, you can actually throw a bunch of different things on the wall and see what sticks because we, the, the internet, we can slice and dice people to the specific degree. It's not about finding the widest audience, it's about finding the right audience. And so it's no longer women or men over 25, under 25, but it's really finding that niche audience to become evangelist and empower and to spread the word. Um, that's, that's what works. And so whether that's doing A-B testing early on or seeing what fits, maybe to call a film foreign, it actually aliens alienates an audience. Maybe it's better to call it a sci-fi thriller or independent, yep. you know. We have the opportunity and the data now to experiment. Uh, BitTorrent. Um, I mean, you had, I, I believe, immense challenges uh, fighting against the brand, uh, but you did it for a particular reason of uh, audience engagement. So what, what did you get out of working at BitTorrent uh, in terms of like you know, getting to know who people are and, and marketing content to them. Sure. So I think what creators and no matter what platform you use, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, you know, you should really dive into those analytics. Even Google, you know, can provide trends down to the region and you can see, wow, uh, a lot of people in this part of the world are talking about my film. How do you use that data to empower sales? It's about learning who these people are and unfortunately platforms like Amazon and Netflix don't share that information so that's a black hole but how do you still be able to gauge that I think is key because there are surprises you may think your audience is you know young teenage boys on BitTorrent but in the reality they're you know women over the age of 45 you don't really? know there are those surprises I mean you that's what's exciting. Let's test it and, and try it out. So what were the big surprises for you? I mean, every film is different. That's the surprise. The surprise is that each platform doesn't only cater to one audience to dive into the numbers and to say, oh, the platform is this type of audience is, I think, very naive. Laura. Ted and open data and the startup mentality. And we'd also talked about it over the uh, over the breakfast, so... Well, I, I, again, putting it back to the, the film community, I, I, I think there's a real, there's a, there's a shift of being completely 120% um, focused on your specific film you're making right now or want to make um, versus looking at your entire career as a filmmaker or as a, uh, a, a, a film division within a, a market and thinking of it longer term. And so it's, it's really about many of the things that, that Mitch and, and Missy are talking about are, are the due diligence of looking at it as, as a long-term investment in your future of, of being part of a content pipeline, as, as, as non-artsy as that sounds, and educating yourself. And that's a, it's a constant reinvestment. That's being willing to work with professional sales agents and ask them a million questions, not just hand off your film, be a partner. So I, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I'm not sure how to relate that back to TED and, and, and open data, but um, it, it's part of having a larger perspective and always being a student and being, humble isn't exactly the right word, but open. Um, because it is, the ground is shifting under you and, and a lot of us got caught flat-footed in the indie film days in, in, in Los Angeles where we watched our, our business just go away and we're still making the movies, but we, don't, we no longer know how to get them out. And, we, and, and the lag, and it's fun to see things are catching back up, but it's, it's, about, it's about always being that hungry um, for information. Well, we, we spoke uh, earlier this week at our other panel about what if you, all, you do get an SVOD deal, you do get a deal, and it's a two-year deal or three-year deal. Then what are you doing when it ends? Right. Are you thinking about that? Because that's great and it helps the filmmaker, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the project. There are so many other opportunities out there that you've got to be aware of that. And that doesn't start at, oh, it ended three years. No, that starts earlier, preparing everyone. And I don't know if people look at that. I know in the past they hadn't, but now that's so relevant. That's where the long tail comes in and sustained money is coming in for the producer to make their next film. Well, not to mention you might not have paid your investors back. It's always a good thing, <laughs> right? I mean, the people will stay with you a long time if you, if you evidence a commitment to have some fiduciary responsibility. Um, even if they're willing to continue losing money, you need, they need to see that you're attempting to make their money back. 
So this actually leads us to the topic of guidance. And, and I think also on Saturday where we had the European Film Forum and I had some discussion later, some disappointed people came to me and said that where's the golden horse? That where, where's the model? Um, and, um, and I think it would be very interesting to, to look at your different perspective on this guidance because some say that the European Commission should give the guidance some say that the national film organizations uh, should give guidance, trade organizations. Where is the responsibility and, uh, and where, where should the guidance come from and what, what should we do? Well, I mean, if, if we would have like the golden line to, to solve everything, we wouldn't be sitting here having these discussions. It would be... I mean, the, the thing is that we are all part of that guidance. And I think the, the most important thing is that each and every one of us has to take part in that. It's not that we can say, okay, I mean, the European Commission, they can put out guidelines and then everything is solved. It's not, because, I mean, we are in a business that is developing day by day. So me as a sales agent, the producer, the director, the broadcasters, everyone has to be involved in, in, on, on the different subjects and aspects, and it's about communication to, to figure out along the way how can we use this as opportunities and not as threats. How can we open the windows instead of breaking them? And, and I really think it's, it's about communication on all the change. And I mean, what we see more and more is, I mean, when we're working with films, we are not there once a film is ready and it has been launched at a festival. No, we are there from the very first beginning and the first idea. And we are, you know, working together on developing the movie from the idea stage over the script and, and all the way through also talking about when to put it out into the market, when to make people aware of it. So it's really a communication all the way around and remembering that it's like we're talking films, we're talking people. We are like a business that is living. We're like living creatures. We're not just, it's not just a machine and it's not easy just to give a guidance saying, okay, let's do like this. We produce, we do, and it's ready for January the film. So it means it has to be in Berlin. That's not the way we're working anymore today. So it's, yeah. And, and I mean, we talked earlier and it wasn't really up to speed on what BitTorrent had been doing. And that is a burgeoning market. That's another opportunity out there. And it's a, back in 2005, I opened up public libraries around the world. Everyone laughed at me. But that was a market where we got data. There was money for the, for the producers. And that's what we wanted to do. So it's those niche markets that complement what's going on there. Yes, we love the iTunes, Google. We love all of them. They're great and everything. But that time ends. And then you've got to fulfill that promise down the line. And BitTorrent should become one. Of, we talk, will Facebook become one? We don't know, but you need to be open to all those opportunities because that is the future of us monetizing and making sure we can do our next production. We work in a very unruly industry where there's no roadmap. And I think it falls on all of us to have a part, you know, in, in coming together and creating that hive mind for transparency, for sustainability. Let's not disrupt it, but let's enhance it and strengthen it. And a strong sales is going to be a strong next project for a director, which is going to be strong for the distributor and high tides raise all boats. Um, I think that, you know, that's, that's the guidance, all of us together. It's on us to participate and rise up for that. Mm. And then, of course, it is important to get all the information, to have the transparency from the different platforms. And, I mean, that's probably one of the most important things, is to figure out a way also to get that information from the bigger players like Amazon and Netflix. Because once you do have a deal with Netflix, well, fine, take the money and run. But you don't know how many people did actually see the movie, who, what was the reaction on the movie. And so somehow, and, and I mean, that's where everyone needs to think and try to be creative in how to get that information. And that, because that that's is being worked really on. They are, there are companies working on that because it is a problem. So there's got to so be a solution. You, you are working with all the big heavyweights, so what do you actually see as trends uh, in that landscape? Because I think one of the interesting discussions always that's been around here is that in one way, uh, the, the big ones, Netflix and Amazon, they are like the, um, again, like an Olympic win, because there's some rumors about like big numbers being offered to you at the same time. They're also being perceived somewhat as, as threatening to to the smaller, uh, smaller venues and smaller businesses. So what's, what's happening there? No, but on, on that side, I take a different perspective. I look at Netflix coming in not as the big, bad giant. I look at it as literally going, it's a challenge. 
you know what, they're coming in, they're having a business model created, and now, now other companies will be able to get their act together and match them. Like, everything's all got to be started somewhere. In the early days of, of video, back in the 80s, Blockbuster came into the United States. They had 100 stores, and the mom and pop, oh, how could they come in? This is going to kill us. They came in, they challenged everyone, and the smarter retailers got their acts together, and all of a sudden we had multiple retailers out there. I, I've got to believe that that's what Netflix and Amazon challenging coming in will be like, you know what? No, we can do this. We have a better interface. We can curate better. We have an audience, and now we can get this business going. So it's a good thing that they're going there. And, you know, it's wonderful that they're embracing film and distributing it, but it's just the beginning. It really, I used to say it's the Wild West. We'd always say, oh, it's the Wild, maybe it's the Wild East. <laughs> I, I was just going to say on, on guidance, there's, I think what's emerging, I was really encouraged to hear what Lucia yes. said, that, that all of that was fantastic, by the way. Um, uh, there's the guidance of the industry, which is the setting of these standards, which is beginning to have the communication, which is enough pressure to extract somehow or extrapolate data. And if Amazon won't tell us, just by the vacuum, like astronomers use, you know, like the black, blackness so we can measure what is not happening or what's going on. We'll figure it out somehow. That's guidance for the industry so that there's a context. And then there are, there's a commitment and a resurgence, I think, that has to happen um, in institutions that support filmmakers to uh, continue this ongoing learning. And there, there's been a real, a real l slack off in terms of a, of a mature filmmaker community. There's a one, there's a starting early days filmmaking community and there's less, and Missy may disagree in terms of, of the, the Sundance alums and, and those folks, but I feel like there's not a, there's, there's less cohesion uh, in that guidance to bring and share the information with industry professionals of, of going next step. So it's the, the two pieces. So suddenly directors become marketers. I mean, I think what's most important is what you said. Be creative in your release. Let's not be afraid. Let's look at new channels. Let's test things. I think competition is good. I think, like, let's not move forward in a fear-based attitude, but let's test things out and see what works and then come back as a community and learn from each other. And also, when you when you say like Netflix as a threat or, or not uh, or as an opportunity, I mean Netflix will not take all the films that are produced in the world. So I mean, there's some of the lucky punches where you say, okay, you do a great deal with Netflix, take the money and run, invest the money in, into a new film, and then there are the other films that will go in another direction and will go the more traditional way. So it's like opportunities, and it's finding the best little piece and corner of, of everything. Nothing, is, nothing today is wrong or right. And that's kind of, you know, bo both may be frustrating, but also a fantastic opportunity. So remember, there's a, there's a technology trickle-down effect from this whole thing. When Netflix started, they started with Roku, and neither would be relevant without each other. And Roku has become 11, 12 million set boxes out there. The Blu-ray Blu played it. Now Amazon has Alexa voice control. So these are going to help the curation as top of it. So it's not just getting the film out, it's the back-end technology that will help not just Netflix, Amazon, but all the new companies coming in. So there's a, another positive aspect, which will only help filmmakers. Do we have some questions from the audience? Estonia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here you go. Yeah, you've uh, said a lot about the um, opportunities and opening up the windows, and it's all very positive. So, uh, and, and I totally agree. But I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit about the uh, obstacles that you're meeting in, the, in this context, because it's not just hunky dory and we can do as we please, because uh, there, there are people who. A lot of uh, things working against it, right? Yeah, I mean that's and and that is and I mean especially within Europe, what you can see is that, I mean of course the opportunities are there and there are tests being made, but and that's why the communication is so important because the exhibitors are obviously afraid to take in films that are released and they are saying if your film is going on a p digital platform at the same time, we won't take the film into our cinemas. So that's one obstacle. The next obstacle as well is the distributors and, and who have 
who are living from the windows, but it's really, and that's why, I mean, a lot of our time also with Europa International is talking together with the distributors, the association Europa Distribution and Europa Cinema to try to find a way together how to solve this. And I think also on the economical side in, in the different tests, and there's been like, you know, that um, many programs through Creative Europe as well, where the different things are being tested with day and date releases and I think one, one of the important things is in order to make those tests real we need to to work together and we also need to get a share meaning that the exhibitors should maybe also get a share of the income that might come on the digital platform in order to try in, in a better way and I mean we've been talking about this within Europe for the last what five seven years something like that and it seems like we get two, two steps forward and then we take one step back again so it takes forever and I really feel that we've been having these kind of conversations for many years and it's why we most of us are there and ready to do it but it happens very, very slowly within Europe. What we can see now, at least what's happened in the last years, is that it's working in the UK now, it's working in Poland and in some other countries. Scandinavia will be one of the last together with France, I think, where it's going to work because there you have very persistent <laughs> people and, and obstacles some, some, in some countries also through law. So that's where, I mean, the European Commission might be able to get in to at least have the law issues out of the way. But yes, it's like opening the windows and it sounds much more easy than it is. But it's keep on trying and at a certain point it, it will be open. But it is dialogue and we're talking a lot, trying to not manipulate but discuss and make you know the awareness around see, seeing what's happening in the US, seeing that it's actually, you have a film that is out on a digital platform even before it's in the cinemas, but that it's imposing that people are going into the cinemas because they heard about it from someone who watched it digitally. So it's, it's I totally agree, it's not easy, and it's, it's a long talk, and it's something, again, that we all need to be involved in to try to, um, to make it work. I actually want to really quickly follow up on day and date. Because, like again, on, on StoryTech forum, we had we had a discussion with uh, with colleagues from Sony and and states, and and day and date release, there is a quite quite a normality where in Europe it could be sometimes considered quite abnormality, and it's uh, for me it's been quite puzzling uh, about it because for me as an audience it's it's a benefit, but who holds it back? Is it the audience? Is it the distributors? Is it the no? But it didn't didn't get there overnight. It, like, it took a while to get there. Mm -hmm. It was the indies going six weeks out, you know, two months out, and the major studios not. It has not been a simple, we're going day and date at all. And it's still a problem. And now it's still even more EST, more day and date, and VOD down the line. Mm -hmm. So it's, that riddle has been, it's same, same problems. So sad. I, I still think there's a real opportunity to do an end run and, and uh, change distribution. Uh, to identify these big gaps that don't make sense. I, I feel like the, the media business has always been separate from, I mean, other than the Monopoly days when the, when the theater owners and, and studios uh, were separated, but the, that we follow where the screens are or the channels are as opposed to building the channels and the people who are building platforms still don't understand how to create this pipeline. And so, but we do. We know how to funnel a whole bunch of content that isn't finding a home in this stratifying world. So if folks can build Skype, right, how, how is Skype populated? It's populated by a different content um, funnel of, of, of conversation. I feel like we could, we could identify that, and as an industry, that's a conversation to have. And I actually quickly want to follow up, because there are many people who weren't at StoryTech, and one of the examples that we talked about channels and new formats was TED. Mm -hmm that it actually created something totally new. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, short just, form documentary. Yeah, is that, that, you know, Ted's done many things as a brand and you can watch that as a case study, but to me the interesting takeaway is the meme of the short talk, which has changed conferences around the world. But it also, once it became TED.com, what's proliferated and what they've seen um, in terms of creating a market, a, a value uh, and an audience for essentially short-form documentary, because they're not interviews, 
And that's new. Would you have believed 10 years ago that there was a market for, there's barely a market for uh, long-form, beautifully produced, important documentaries. The fact that there's a market for short-form uh, documentary is fascinating. So who to thunk? They, they literally created a distribution channel, and I think that's a really something that we can, we can learn from um, with, with an even richer... Yeah, and interesting there is also that it's, it's not only uh, happening online, but for example, TED Talks are being broadcasted in Japan as well on prime time on NHK. So mm -hmm. it's something that has come quite directly from the outer rim of the universe and has kind of... That's right. And in their case, what they've done is they gave it away for free at the start. So, mm -hmm. you know, they created an audience over time and then they were able to package the best of and sell them to airlines or sell them to broadcast. But, you know, you have to create demand for your product by kind of giving some stuff away for free. Well, as Mitch would say, they've seeded it yeah. um, for a long time yeah. of, long of time. peaking that, that people want to feel like the Renaissance people these days. Right, so Ted, Ted touches that, that thing in us that wants to be an international sophisticate-ish um, and, and to, to watch that. But no, but they, but they appealed to that. It was exclusive and then it became suddenly revealed content. So it was a window into an exclusive world. Um, and then it was, oh, digestible bites of interesting things. And so it was a very interesting rollout. Uh, even before it became a sophisticated digital content model. And make no mistake, TED started out as a certain kind of conference, and then when Chris Anderson bought it, he's a, he's a very experienced publisher. So he always looked at TED as a content, <coughs> from a content, I don't know if he looked at it as a content business, but from a content strategy, in terms of he really does genuinely believe in ideas worth sharing. So what are the tools available? And, I, and back to filmmaking, um, it, is, it is all the things we've been saying of understanding who you're speaking to. What idea are you sharing? And who are you making the movie for? If you're making it for an audience, then get to know that audience and know where they are. And, and free is not bad. It, if it's the right, and this is a film conference, but on the TV side, which I did on the TV side, I always give away an episode. I always give away an episode because I want the consumer to actually take and go, oh, I really love it. It's not going to hurt me. It's marketing. And if I find that customer because they really enjoy that, most likely they're coming back for more. So there's always something. There's biteable pieces that can be created early in the production. Mm -hmm. There's always something. So free is not negative. And you can also monetize free. That's the whole thing as well. There are places, we know YouTube, Daily Motion. No, but we know there's all those traditional places that you can get data from that are there that I don't know if it's another piece of the digital ecosystem. Digital is the sum of the whole, and that's what we're discussing. It's not one. There's no golden ticket. But there's a lot of little tickets to go, and then you go. And you've said a couple of times, so now directors have to be marketers. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that. I don't think they have to necessarily be technologists either, but they need to know that they live in that map. They need to know that they need the marketer in, a, in, a, in an earlier, uh, more transparent way. They need to know that they have to understand the technology trends that are going to affect how their, their story is, is found in the world. Um, it doesn't mean they need to be experts on those things. They just need to know that what, what the ecosystem is that they now have to operate in. Do you have one more question? I do agree with one more thing. The multiple languages is becoming more and more important as ever. And I don't, I don't think anyone puts such an emphasis on it, but it really is probably the most important thing. Because if you want to find a diverse audience, you've got to invest in that. And that's another part of the back end scenario. But the local light is becoming more and more rearing its head of like, why is it not in this language? Why is it not in this language? So that was my favorite point of what I enjoyed everything, but that was the point that just got me. So, thank you. So to wrap it up, I think the, the interesting um, themes that pop out of today was exactly guidance and that needs to come from us and we all need to make a collective effort and I, and I think it's a good open call because here are policymakers, filmmakers, sales agents, exhibitors, distributors, tech people, so let's make an effort. Secondly, the long tail, um, instead of getting the money now, you're maybe doing your pension fund. Um, <laughs> Uh, hopefully, and and also I think the the idea that's uh, that's been popping out in the in the past uh, few days discussion is also actually the new skill set and um, and also the fact that we all need to make um, efforts um, to be able to participate um, yeah, in this new form of creativity. So thank you very much.